Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, so uh, as Chris mentioned, this is a, a bit of a starter kit for us to go into machine learning. And it, it's, it's useful for us to just kind of demystify it a bit. Uh, what does it mean to us? Where does it fit into other kind of uh, uh, things like artificial intelligence or deep learning or neural networks and, and these things that we often hear? Um, what is it we can do with it and uh, how we can uh, apply it? So that's what we're going to go into today. Um, before we really get into it, um, I'm hoping that you will uh, be willing to just share a bit about your current understanding of machine learning. Uh, if you don't mind to go to uh, the survey through this QR code or through uh, menti.com and use the six digit code. Um, uh, just so I have an understanding of where your uh, uh, current understanding of machine learning is. And then also if there's a particular aspect of uh, what we're going to go into today that resonates with you that you'd like to know more about, um, it'd be useful to know uh, these things so I can spend more time on it. Um, so maybe just take a, a few minutes uh, and then we can uh, proceed. Thanks, June, for sharing the code in the chat. Okay, so seems many of you have uh, some some uh, understanding uh, of machine learning, uh, which is which is good. You're you're in the right place, uh, and and hopefully we uh, can augment uh, your understanding by going a bit uh, uh, deeper into the ways that uh, machine learning can be applied. Okay, and, and not very surprisingly, many of you would like to know uh, more of the use cases of machine learning. Um, and, and many of you also would like to know what, is, what does it take for us uh, to apply machine learning in our, in our organizations. Um, okay, this is, okay, that's, that's pretty much the, the thing. Okay, so I think we'll go ahead and just and, uh, go with these things and I'll spend a bit more time on, on the use cases. Okay, so, so many of you might have uh, um, interacted with Palo IT before. We're, we're, a, we're an international consultancy that uh, helps large companies solve problems by, by offering uh, product development, but also uh, engaging with companies uh, to undergo uh, uh, certain transformations, uh, either how, how we can use uh, AI to automate decision making or how we can use data um, uh, in order to drive uh, decision making. Um, so machine learning fits in very nicely into uh, what, what we can offer, and uh, we'll go a little bit deeper in, into that today. Uh, but as an ethic, it's, it's useful to, to just share that we, we look at how um, machine learning, or sorry, uh, how, how technology can be used as a force for good in, in all our interactions and all our uh, opportunities that, that we work with. Um, so this, this is at the heart of everything that we do. So for me, this is quite an interesting proposition. Uh, I'm also interested in the way that, you know, as a, as a B Corp uh, company now, uh, so uh, Palo IT received the B Corp certification, uh, how, how technology is a, is a force for good in the community and how it is a force for good for us. Uh, for me, I come from a, a business background uh, and going into the technical aspect of, of machine learning. So it helps me to maintain a bit of a, a business focus on uh, something that otherwise would be a very uh, technically driven uh, process uh, where most people come from a, a software development background. Uh, because, so because I come from a different angle, then it, it gives me a certain perspective uh, that helps to also maintain this focus on using technology as a force for good. Uh, this is an interesting quotation that I think will be relevant to many of you who are attending today, uh, today's session. Um, that it won't be so much that AI is going to replace us, of course, maybe, maybe decades down the line it may, uh, but but uh, at this at this point uh, we're just thinking about how things like AI can be augmenting uh, what we're doing already in our organizations and machine learning fits in very nicely to AI which I'll go into a little bit later but since this is about a, uh, machine learning you're in the right place uh, we're talking here is talking about AI but AI and machine learning have a definite connection so today what we're going to do uh, in order to talk about machine learning is we'll just look at it from a very high level what is it 
uh, and how do we relate to it? Uh, and, and this is where we'll go uh, very deeply in, uh, or we'll cover a broad range of use cases where machine learning can come in. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about how, how Palo IT has applied machine learning in some of its uh, engagements and how we are using it internally. Um, then we'll look at some of the lessons learned from these engagements as well as some research that we have done. Uh, how does it impact the organization and what are the implications it has on the organizational culture and things like this. Uh, we'll look at what is required uh, for uh, machine learning to take root uh, in an organization, which has a lot of connection to the previous uh, section. And then finally, we'll look under the hood uh, a bit uh, in the, uh, of, of how machine learning works in practice. And the reason we want to go into this is because when we have a better understanding of what it actually takes to create a machine learning model, uh, we're able to empathize better with those who are creating such models, and we know how better to support them. Okay, uh, so that's the reason we go into that and, and, and we, it gets a little bit more technical, but that's okay. I, uh, it, it's, it's done in a way that it maintains a business focus and just uh, touches on some uh, information that you may have learned uh, across your life. And we'll, and we'll tie it all together with a highly fictional company called Bragg uh, to, to touch, uh, touch the ground. Uh, just by the way, I, I think I hear some shuffling in the in the background. So if you don't mind to uh, help me by uh, muting your microphones as you come in, uh, that, that, would, that would, I think help us uh, all to uh, have a good focus. Okay, so uh, we'll go to the to the top level. What is machine learning? Uh, so now uh, machine learning fits into a context of of both artificial intelligence and this other concept we may have heard many times called deep learning. Um, so if we just think that deep learning, which I'll go into in a moment, is a subset of machine learning. And machine learning as a, as a broader thing is a subset of artificial intelligence. So then we'll start with artificial intelligence we'll work our way down. Um, now, when we think of artificial intelligence, many of us may think about you know, the, the kind of uh, sci-fi movies that we have watched before, uh, Space Odyssey, Aliens, um, iRobot, things like that, where uh, the robots have a kind of consciousness that simulate human behavior and, and decision making and things like this. So while this has relevance to the notion of artificial intelligence, uh, I just want to just dis dispel this a little bit and, and put it into a way that, uh, you know, in, in, in business terms, we, we can actually use artificial intelligence. So, so the idea is that artificial intelligence is just the application of some degree of intelligence to a machine to simulate uh, human uh, decision making, okay? And this breaks down into two, into two different types of, uh, of artificial intelligence. Uh, the first is narrow AI, narrow AI, and the second is general AI. So we'll start with narrow AI and, and build our way up. Narrow AI is just the application of intelligence to um, a machine to make it do a, a specific task and to do it very well, very fast. Um, and so we can see some use cases of this where um, if we think about industry 4.0, uh, or the Internet of Things. We can think about these drones that fly around a, a factory taking uh, pictures of, uh, of the, the production floor at certain intervals and then send it back to a centralized place for processing um, or uh, the, the actual machines being able to automate the manufacturing process, things like this. This is, this is where uh, uh, narrow AI comes in, as well as optimization uh, 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 problems where we want to minimize the cost for, for uh, production or we want to optimize our supply chain network, uh, making sure that we can um, uh, take into account potential disruptions to the supply chain. So this is where narrow AI is, is very useful and very uh, uh, relevant. Now general AI is something that is the notion that comes to our mind, the sci-fi movie uh, idea of artificial intelligence. This is the, the ability to have a, a broad range of intelligence so that to, to the effect that if a machine gets a new task that it has not done before, it has enough intuition to know how to do that task. Okay, so this is something we are not uh, yet, uh, yet there. And the, the closest we have come is uh, with a super, supercomputer that Fujitsu had created where they, create, they, they tried to simulate a second of neural activity in the brain. Um, and to, to simulate that one second of neural activity, it took the supercomputer 40 minutes. Okay, so just in terms of you know, duration, right, we can kind of see that one second versus 40 minutes, we are, we are very far from, from there. But this is something that maybe in the coming decades we can experience, maybe in 20 years from now, uh, we will be able to see. Um, 
so now uh, uh, we, we so we don't need to worry so much about the the general AI bit. Uh, we can just put it off to the side, keep it for our curiosity and our imagination. But for this, we'll talk mostly about narrow AI. And you can imagine for uh, many applications of narrow AI, there may not be a learning component. Uh, but where there is a learning component, machine learning comes in very prominently. So if we think about uh, just for a moment how human beings learn. So when we are young, we uh, are using our senses to interact with the world. We can see things, we can hear things, smell things, and so on. And we have our parents that are there to uh, tell us, you know, what is it that we are experiencing? If we look at a tree, our parents will tell us that's a tree and we'll think, oh, okay, so that's a tree. And then we'll continue walking with them and we'll see another tree and they'll say, oh yeah, that's another tree. We say, oh, okay. So now then we start to have a pattern that emerges in our brain about what constitutes a tree. And to such an extent that when we see the next tree, we can correctly identify it as a tree. Uh, and we can distinguish it from a ball or a child or a leaf or a bush, right? Um, so in the same way, uh, machine learning uh, uh, works where its experience is data. So then in, intuitively, uh, the same that we, the way that we are learning, the more that we see something, the more we become accustomed to it and know what that is, um, the, uh, a machine is able to um, understand what it, uh, if something is a in reality, a tree based on what has what data it has seen of trees. Okay, so the more data that we give to a machine learning model, the better that that model will perform. Okay, so in this way, you're not telling exactly the machine what is a tree. Uh, you are giving it the data that it needs in order to make inferences about what is a tree. All right. Now with that, we have two ways of using machine learning. One of them is from a historical perspective. The other one is future looking. So from a historical perspective, we can think about what are the drivers for a certain thing to happen. So if a product has sold well, uh, what is it about that product, its attributes, uh, its associations to other products that made it to sell well, okay? That way we come up with the drivers of what has led to good sales, okay? In, in a bit of a different way, um, it also is able to think of sequences or is able to identify good sequences. So if you think of an omni-channel context where you have customers going through the, their own customer journeys and they go from uh, one channel to another, um, if you feed that data to a uh, machine learning model, it will be able to determine where, uh, what, what sequences were useful. When a, when a customer went from uh, channel four to channel five, they had a much higher conversion rate uh, than ones that did not go through that sequence. Okay, um, so in that in that way, uh, it can give you valuable feedback about uh, how you can tailor the channels in such a way that the customers will pass through channels four and five, or ch channel four, two, five in that order, or for those other channels six, seven, eight, whatever, uh, how they can be recalibrated or how they can be um, uh, uh, reimagined in the general omni-channel context. Okay. Now, with this information from history, we can now project into the future, right? If I, if I know that a product has sold well because of certain attributes, I can then uh, think about uh, for the next product, it may have these attributes, how well will it sell, okay? If I pair this shirt with these pants, what can I expect given the previous information about these pairings or about these product attributes and so on, okay? Um, I can also do things like, you know, uh, how much will, uh, how much revenue can we expect in the, in the next quarter, given that we have performed this well in previous quarters, um, whether a transaction is fraudulent or not, given the series of transactions that we have had over time, and so on, right? So we get, get a sense of how it, machine learning can make predictions. And similarly with recommendations, you, you, uh, many of you have Netflix, many of you have used Amazon before. I think you, we know how recommendations work. Um, so we won't go too much into this, but we can imagine that this is also a way that machine learning can be used to anticipate what a customer wants or likes, okay? Now finally we come to deep learning, which is a, a subset of machine learning where um, it tries to the simulate the, the structure of the brain, so the architecture of the brain. Uh, and this is different from the, uh, the, the Fujitsu example I gave earlier, where that's trying to simulate brain activity. Here, it is just trying to simulate the architecture, okay? Um, now, uh, with, with deep learning, uh, you, can, you, can, um, you can use it to uh, work with data that is highly uh, connected to each other. So for example, if you look at an image, 
the pixels of that image are highly correlated to one another, right? So the pixels on my face right now on my image, the, the, all the pixels here are quite related because they have similar colors and, and things like that. But then once it goes into my hair, it knows that it's no longer my face, right? And then once it goes beyond my hair and my face, it starts to detect that I have a you know, background that is not very useful, right? So uh, this is where deep learning comes in uh, very, very usefully. Now, uh, in a similar way to machine learning, uh, you have two ways of using it. One is in terms of recognition, which is in a way of a historical thing. And the other is in terms of generation, the, the new things, the, the future kind of, uh, kind of things. Now, with, with recognition, we can, we can think of uh, applications in uh, either computer vision or uh, uh, automated, uh, uh, automated vehicles, uh, things like that, where it needs to make detections about uh, what, where things are and what things are. Right? So I can detect that that's a cone, or that's a tree, that's a child that's running, how fast is it running, things like that. Um, as well as in a meeting of 10 people, who is it that is speaking? Based on the, 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 the voice uh, timbre, based on the tone, based on the diction, based on the grammar, many of these features that can be fed into a deep learning model. Okay? In, a, in, a, in a different way, uh, in terms of generation, uh, this actually is a very exciting area. So uh, many of you have heard of deep fakes before. Um, how a, an actor's face can be spliced onto another actor and, and simulating all the facial features, the, the emotions, the, you know, the eye movements, all of these things um, uh, to, to create uh, you know, a situation where that person has never been in. Uh, many of you have been, may have seen this, this video of Obama uh, <laughs> saying things that he, he would never have said before, things he's saying about Trump and about uh, the American society and things like this. Um, but was uh, actually a, a fake video of Obama that was created by Jordan Peele. I, mean, I can send a, a link later if, if there's uh, interest in this thing. But basically, it's, it's this idea of being able to uh, put a face on, on someone in a video that they have not actually interacted before. So we can imagine where we can use this for the creation of avatars in a company. Um, how we can, if we have a smart bot, how we can personalize a smart bot uh, by giving it a fake face. Uh, and giving it the ability to make motions and, and things like that. But then also in terms of how we can use deep learning to create uh, new stories. Uh, you, you may have heard of OpenAI and how it can create novels uh, and how it can also be used to create articles or poems, things like that. And, and the a business application of this is where you can create uh, subject lines that are, are catchy that uh, you know will um, uh, people will open the email and, and email text that uh, will be uh, informative and useful and relevant, right? So we can, we can use this kind of uh, technology to, to simulate these kind of things. So I, as exciting as deep learning is, we're not going to go into it uh, today. Uh, if we want to go into another session of deep learning, then uh, I'm more than happy to do something like that. And we'll have a time at the end to provide such feedback. Uh, but for us, we're, we're gonna focus on uh, machine learning in this session. Okay, so many of you wanted to learn, know more about use cases, so I'll spend some time here. Um, we, we can imagine there's a whole broad range of use cases for machine learning, but we'll just touch on a few categories and some uh, specific UK use cases under, under each of them. The first one is in terms of how machine learning can contribute to revenue growth. So if we have uh, leads, uh, we have opportunities or potential clients that we want to uh, make sure we don't waste our time or that we use our resources very effi uh, efficiently, uh, that we want to optimize our allocation of resources, uh, then we might be able to score uh, each lead and then be able to pair the, the prioritized leads with the most successful salesman or wh whatever it is. Um, uh, how we might be able to, I mentioned earlier about how we can use machine learning to anticipate uh, whether a product will sell or not. So then if we know the attributes that a product will, uh, will, will take on, uh, uh, at the design phase, then we can go ahead and move it into the machine learning model to determine, is this something that we should even prototype, right? So if we know, so then if the machine learning model tells us that, yes, it will sell well based on history, then we know that we can advance in the product development process, um, going into prototyping and then uh, perhaps even scaling up to uh, full, full scale production and things like that. Um, uh, we, we've, we've seen already how Netflix and Amazon can recommend to us the, the next best offer, the, the product that is most relevant to our purchase history or relevant to the product that we are now looking at or that we have looked at previously. All of these things can come in to determine what is the uh, anticipated need uh, of, of a customer. 
right? So when you when you look at all of these things, you can find opportunities to be able to cross sell and upsell um, uh, as a, as a means for being able to create uh, uh, to generate revenue. Another way uh, is looking at uh, in terms of our internal operations how they can be optimized or how they can be made more efficient. Um, the way that we can we can anticipate if a if a machine is going to fail or not and avoid costly repair fees. Um, we, we, can, uh, we can provide a, a, a preventive maintenance in advance of such a failure so that uh, uh, we, we can detect uh, a week from today if a machine is going to fail. And then if so, then I need to do something today in order to rectify a potentially bad situation in the future. Um, how we can use uh, uh, forecasting for demand with uh, machine learning. Um, so uh, based on, based on the, the portfolio of products and services that I have, uh, and given the trend over time, uh, what is what is the, the trend going forward? Um, and, and maybe it's useful to just pause a moment here just to talk about um, uh, uh, machine learning and novelty. So uh, machine learning indeed has been able to open up new doors for us, um, but it also has tremendous opportunity to improve upon previously used methods. So demand forecasting as, a, as an example is not something that is new. Right? So we've been using demand forecasting for some time now, but the way that machine learning fits into demand forecasting is that it can improve the accuracy uh, of our forecasting methods. And, and when we're talking about an improvement of, you know, even percentages, even if it's one or 2%, when we're, when we're talking about uh, millions of dollars in revenue, this is not a small number, right? So that, that improvement of accuracy can have major implications uh, for an organization in terms of forecasting, okay? Uh, we can also use it for uh, employee retention where we otherwise might have to train up a new staff and we have to have to suffer the loss of experience and, con and context um, and, and getting someone ramped up and onboarded and all of these um, uh, uh, costs uh, by making sure that those uh, employees that uh, are performing well and that we want to retain are able to be retained and if they are likely to leave that we know why they are wanting to leave and so then when we know that then we know how we can intervene so if we um, if we if if there's a machine learning model that knows, you know, uh, where, where, uh, how someone is working, um, uh, with whom they are working, on what projects they're working, what are the interests, uh, do they feel engaged, what is their happiness, all of these things, then we know exactly where to uh, provide a tailored intervention. Uh, we put them with people that they want to work with as an example, right? Um, so in this way, we have a means of being able to uh, create and make interventions or to inform interventions. We can also use machine learning for risk management, um, where I, I mentioned earlier about fraudulent transactions. Um, if we have a series of data points of all the transactions that have occurred in, in the last six months, and we know uh, which of these transactions for a fact were fraudulent, then we know how to predict fraud, uh, fraudulent transactions in the future, given uh, the, the phone that was used to create the transaction, given the amount, and if there was a decimal uh, in, the, in the amount, um, it, uh, who was the recipient, from where was that transaction initiated? Many data points that ultimately can be um, useful uh, in terms of being able to make determinations about whether a, tra a transaction is potentially fraudulent or not, or is fraudulent or not or even being able to go through the millions of logs uh, to determine if there were, is an anomaly and, and, uh, and if there are signals of security uh, flaws and so that we can have ready data to patch up uh, uh, sec our, our security uh, frameworks. Um, uh, many of these ways that machine learning can, can parse through uh, amounts of data that we otherwise would not be able to go through well as, as humans, right? Um, and, and then finally, um, how we might be able to envision new ways of doing business. Uh, if, we're, if we're thinking generally about getting to a market of one, right? The idea that we go to a customer segment that is comprising of one person, which is, which is you, right? Um, uh, we, we can find ways to customize services or to present uh, data in a way that is um, uh, tailored for a certain individual and to provide recommendations or to provide uh, meaningful insights that are very specific to individuals. All of these things help us to treat customers with greater person, uh, personality, uh, if you like, um, and, and, and be able to provide new experiences. Um, uh, so this, these are all things that, that can be done for, for, uh, from a, a customer relationship perspective. So these are just a, a set of ways that machine learning can be done, but as you can imagine, the list goes on and on. 
And we are really just limited by our own creativity, the way that machine learning can be applied in, in whatever context. So uh, it, just to round out the, the discussion uh, just now with some salient points, um, machine learning is highly dependent on quality and abundant data. So again, intuitively, the more data we give to a machine learning model with a greater variety and diversity of data points, the better it will perform. Uh, in that uh, machine learning can be applicable to a wide range of, of use cases. Uh, we are limited by our creativity. Uh, uh, by converse, machine learning is not able to make inferences about data it has not seen. So if you, if you have uh, given it to it images of a of tree, over tree, over tree, and then you show it a ball, it's not going to know that it, that thing is a ball. It will just try to think, okay, is this ball that I'm seeing actually a tree, right? So you need, you need to be able to give data uh, from which it can make inferences. And if it cannot, if you don't give it such data, then it's not able to make inferences uh, based on that. Okay. Uh, and then finally, uh, machine learning is not a magic. So as, as we go through this uh, uh, demystification process about machine learning, uh, we have greater and greater appreciation of what it actually can do, and we know what is what is required for uh, for for its utilization. Okay, but but without that just demystification process, we can we can basically just treat it as a black box and just say, okay, just do machine learning, and then that that doesn't get us very far. All right, so we can we can use some tangible examples uh, of how mach how machine learning has been used by Palo IT in in a, a few uh, uh, examples. Um, one of them is with a, uh, a client that is trying to provide um, customized information for its clients. Um, uh, so it, it knows better uh, the, the data that is coming to it and how it can use this data for its own decision, their own decision making. Um, uh, for, for this process, we, we started off with um, a series of design thinking workshops where we were trying to compile a set of uh, problem statements. And the outcome of this process was we had a rich uh, set of prioritized problem statements so that we knew uh, what data we needed to collect to satisfy each of these statements. Um, and, and, and so with that, we had a very clear problem scope. We, we knew what we were going to achieve uh, and, and we had a context in which we were going to use machine learning. Uh, so then we gathered the data points and we fed that into a, a machine learning model that we could uh, use to uh, 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 forecast the demand. Uh, based on these these data points, and the, the, so the data points that went into the machine learning model and the prediction itself, the demand that was forecasted, all were put into a, a customizable UI for each client, um, each of their clients, um, uh, so that they could receive the the data that they wanted to receive in a manner that they were expecting to receive it. This next uh, example is something I'm I'm quite excited about uh, personally. Uh, we, are, we are creating an automated irrigation system for a farm in Cambodia. And, uh, and with this irrigation system, we, we need to be able to anticipate certain um, situations that we may not be able to irrigate. So for example, uh, when you irrigate during a certain time of day when it's quite hot outside, you run a risk of burning the, the crops. So then between the hours of 11 and 2, you, you cannot irrigate. So then you need two things. You need one, the, the, the whether or not a crop needs to be irrigated at a certain point in time or by a certain point in time. And then secondly, uh, being able to make a schedule based on certain constraints, such as the one I just gave as an example. So in order to do this, we, we, we need to combine, combine both internal and external data. So the external data would come from uh, forecasting, uh, weather forecasting services, uh, whether national or international uh, that, are, that are very well available. Uh, you can get them for free or, or not free, depending on what you are looking for. Uh, and you combine it with the hyper-local uh, conditions on the ground. So we have uh, sensors that detect both uh, attributes of the soil and attributes of the, the, the air. So what is the wind speed and uh, how much it has rained, uh, how hot it is, how humid, it, and so on. So then we're able to create hyper-local uh, data and to triangulate it and correlate it with the external data. Um, and in that way, we're able to have better precision about the, the forecasts. So if it is going to rain, how accurate is that prediction vis-a-vis -vis our, uh, our farm, that, our field, right? Uh, then within with all of that, uh, we can predict uh, what is going to be the soil moisture and therefore whether or not it needs to, that crop, that field needs to be irrigated. Um, again, uh, the, the next part of this is once you know if it needs to be irrigated or not, you need to schedule it. This is where AI comes in. And, and so, so in a way, this, this highlights a case where 
um, machine learning is an input uh, for subsequent uh, decision making, especially those that uh, can be automated. So in this case, creating a schedule uh, in an automated way by uh, through AI uh, is, is one way of, uh, of doing it. And then, and then finally, this, this model becomes future-proofed over time because we are able to feed back into the data the, the real uh, values. So the model may predict that this field will have 25% uh, moisture by uh, 10 p.m. Or, okay, maybe not 10 p.m., let's say uh, two, uh, by uh, 3 p.m. Um, and and, uh, and, and uh, we, we, so we have that prediction, and then we, we at 3 p.m., actually take the reading and we can compare that and we can say, okay, if it's accurate, then great. But if it's not accurate, they can be fed back into the model so that the, the machine learning model can, can learn over time. And so then this is a future proof way of, of ensuring that learning process. Okay. Um, the, the last example that we'll look at is, is another case where um, uh, a, a, uh, a company is trying to determine uh, what is the revenue they can expect for uh, inbound uh, subscribers using using the network for for roaming, uh, for example? So so in this context, we uh, we can see you know with roaming, you are talking effectively about uh, people from other countries coming in, right, uh, or or out. But in this case, we're talking about coming in, and and so you have data that exists in other countries that uh, need to be pulled. Now, people are not always willing to provide uh, their data. In fact, many of you have probably experienced in your own, uh, you know, uh, companies or uh, uh, collaborations that people are are a bit hesitant to just offer their data for for just no reason, uh, or I mean, even presumably there is a reason, but the, they may be uh, less willing. This is where privacy, uh, data privacy laws come in. This is where um, I, I, the idea of that data is the new currency comes in, and people may not just be willing to just offer data for free, uh, things like that. So, so uh, with that, we had to identify the data sources that we needed in order to create this revenue forecasting model uh, and, and engage those teams that had that data. And when we engaged those, those, uh, those teams, we were able to uh, lower the, the barriers, either addressing the privacy issues or addressing the, the benefit issues. Um, and then with this, with this data, we, we were able to create uh, dashboards uh, that, that condensed the data into actionable uh, insights. Um, and then, then subsequently uh, taking that data feeding into a revenue forecasting model um, and in a similar way to the, the accuracy, uh, improvement in accuracy that I had mentioned earlier, uh, being able to provide much greater accuracy than, uh, than previous needs allowed. All right. Okay, so now we'll just reflect a little bit on uh, the, our previous engagements and also the research that is out there. Uh, that have something to offer about the way that machine learning uh, comes into the, the, the organizational context, the, the cultural context. So we just, we take these into uh, certain um, uh, distilled uh, uh, concepts. Uh, the first of which is that machine learning helps uh, our, our organizations to become uh, more scientific and more systematic. So for example, when, when, we have, when we have data, we're using data, we, we have evidence in front of us and that evidence helps us to become more objective. And the more objective that we can become about something, the less driven we are by biases and our own subjectivity. And the, and the less we are reliant on biases and subjectivity, uh, the more that uh, we are building confidence uh, in our decision-making. Um, and, and when we have confidence in our decision-making, we become less reliant on assumptions that have driven previous decision-making. Um, and, and so then, uh, so then we, can, we can see that um, the, the way that we start to think is actually different. We, we've, we start to ask the question, what does the data say before we say, what, has, uh, uh, what have we done before, right? So these, these assumptions start to fall away. And then generally we have, uh, as I mentioned a few times now, uh, we, if we know uh, what has driven uh, certain outcomes, then we are likely to go back to those drivers and to use them for decision making. Right? So, and some of these drivers may not be very visible. In fact, they, certain associations might be uh, quite invisible. Uh, so machine learning helps us to surface these uh, drivers and then for us to now rely upon these drivers uh, for, for decision making. Um, we can also see uh, or appreciate uh, uh, machine learning in the, in the broader context of things that are being done in an organization, both in terms of uh, process, but just generally in terms of uh, culture, where um, if we can democratize the use of machine learning. Uh, so uh, by, by that I mean, 
you, you could have large scale impl implementations of, of machine learning, which are valuable in their own right. And in fact, they should be done. Um, but when they stay at that large scale level, the ability to trickle down into the team level uh, uh, does not uh, allow us to really reap the benefits of using uh, machine learning as, as much as we could, right? So then if we provide it to the team level, then we're giving the teams the tools that they need to, be, uh, to uh, bring in these cultural elements that we saw in the previous slide to become more systematic in their decision making, to have greater confidence, to be able to communicate that confidence. Um, all of that will empower teams to, uh, to, to make uh, much greater uh, decisions. And, and with that, uh, they start to see the, the benefits that come with uh, machine learning. It has helped us to avoid uh, you know, going back on our decision or to uh, avoid damages that were of the, caused by the result of our decision. Um, so they, they can start to see the benefit and then we start to trust. Um, one of the reasons why uh, machine learning has not really taken off in some organizations is because people are more uh, willing to say, you know, I, I, I trust my gut uh, more than I will just trust the data because you can manipulate the data and, and all these things that you know, people say, right? Um, so when they start to make it when we give it down to the team and they start to see the how machine learning actually benefits them and they can experience those benefits, then they are much more likely to, to do another machine learning project in the future or to participate in one. Right. And, and then finally, that it helps us to have uh, a, a certain uh, view or approach to engaging customers. Um, uh, one of the things uh, that is maybe a bit obvious about machine learning is that it is highly quantitative, right? Um, now, people don't like to be treated as numbers. Um, we, we can imagine that the moment we are treated as a, as a statistic on a sheet, we feel dehumanized in some way, right? So then how do we use machine learning, which is highly quantitative, in a way that augments uh, the way that we engage with, with, our, with our clients and our customers? And, and one of the ways is by uh, this, this same idea of when, when we know the, when we, we can use the data to uh, make uh, to, to, to derive understanding about what is it that clients actually care about? What is the drivers of their behavior? Um, when, when we know this, then we can provide such information and such insights uh, to people who are frontline officers or people who have downstream impact on uh, customer facing activities. Um, so this is, this is one way of rather than trying to jump to the end and just say, okay, just uh, go ahead and just make the decision for each person on your, on your own, although it can be done for that. You just have to be careful about how you personalize it. Um, you, can, you can use the insights that come from machine learning to inform how you're interacting with customers, which can be very valuable in its own right. So now what is it required? Uh, what is required for us to implement uh, machine learning? Um, this, this is based on a lot of research that has already been done about why uh, machine learning projects have succeeded or failed. Um, and, and, and many of these uh, appear to be very obvious, but um, because they are the biggest reason for failure, then it is worth saying and uh, perhaps uh, just drilling down into. The, the, the first one is that, you know, in this, this session may contribute a bit to it, and, and I apologize if it does, but sometimes we can walk away with some understanding that machine learning can do so much, and then it, it's so powerful, it can solve all our problems, which I, maybe it could, but, but that uh, we, we just might have this thing that we, we really sensationalize it, and we really blow it out of proportion. Um, and, and we want to be careful about that. So we want to make sure that whenever we go into a machine learning project, we are very reasonable in our expectations of what we want to achieve out of it. Um, so this is also helped by uh, having a very clear uh, business focus that we don't do machine learning for its own sake. We don't do data science projects for its own sake. And data science and machine learning are very close cousins. Uh, in, in many data science endeavors, you're using machine learning um, uh, just to make that connection. Um, but when we, when, we, when we are driven by uh, business objectives, we are more likely to achieve them, uh, especially since we have some uh, better appreciation of what business objectives can actually be achieved. Okay, uh, so we just want to make sure that we are on the ground when we talk about machine learning and we don't blow it too much out of proportion. Not too much, we don't want to blow it out of proportion. Okay, at a, at a level down, let's say at the level in, of implementation, um, the first thing and one of the top reasons why machine learning projects fail is because the leadership is not supporting as they should be. So this is in terms of visibility where, uh, where, where leaders need to be really propounding uh, the, the, the use of machine learning to solve certain problems. Um, and, but, then, but then also 
helping to make connections where connections need to be made between teams, between uh, 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 offering uh, data uh, and other ways that you know, uh, connections need to be made. Um, so with the right support in place, then we have a better chance of being able to get the data that, that is needed. Um, and if, you, if we can't get the data for machine learning, then, then we're finished, right? We, there's no way that machine learning can be done if we don't have data, if we don't have the right data, okay? Um, and, and even when we have the right data, we need to make sure that we operate in a mode of collaboration between um, not just the teams internal to, let's say, an IT organization, um, where you're, where you're uh, 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 collaborating between uh, DevOps and data engineers and, and everyone else, uh, but also with the, with the business units. So uh, the, the expertise uh, and the, the domain experience uh, really comes into play when we think about the way that we identify the sources of data. We, we, we know the data that we need to collect because we have formulated some hypotheses uh, of what is it that we want the model to do. Uh, why is it that this outcome happens? Why is it that this person leaves the company, uh, but this person doesn't? We have to have some hypothesis. When we have those hypotheses, we can identify the data points and then collect and, and, and proceed on with the, with the project. Okay, so collaboration needs to be there. And then finally, um, uh, if we have, we, we need to have data ethics at the, the outset uh, of, of any uh, uh, endeavor. Um, you, you, you all may be familiar with um, uh, a situation that Apple had not too long ago where um, they were offering the same financial product, but to different amounts to women and men. So they were used, so this, this machine learning model was using gender as a criteria for how much to give to an individual. Now, if you can imagine that you had a data ethics team at the, at the beginning, for sure they would have said, you know, using gender as, a, as an input to the data is, is not something we want to use for decision making, right? So uh, especially automated decision making in this case. So Apple got into trouble and you know, uh, the rest is history. But so for us, we need, to be, we need to have data ethics at the beginning so that we can avoid these um, costly uh, 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 litigations down the line. I mean, even though they're not litigation, they just may be situations we don't want to be in, okay? Okay, uh, this may have been a bit fast, so I, I hope that you are keeping up and, and taking everything. Uh, by the way, as you, as you have questions, please feel free to ask them in, in the chat, um, uh, and then I can, I can pick up on it. Um, this last bit, we're going to peek under the hood uh, uh, for how machine learning uh, actually is being done in practice. So the machine learning engineers and the data scientists, what are they actually doing and how are they creating the models? Uh, again, the reason we want to look at this is so that we have a better empathy. And so we, when we have better empathy, we know how to support better, okay? So we will use our main story of the highly fictional company named Bragg uh, and, and look at their current situation. So uh, they have a, a marketplace of drivers and passengers, and this data is all uh, being collected, and they want to use this data to address uh, their, their business objectives. So there are some things here that are, that are very useful um, for the, the, the conditions that, that uh, we need for machine learning. The first is that the data is being automatically generated. There's, there's no additional data collection activities that need to be done, although they can be done, uh, but because the data is already being collected, then uh, it's, uh, it's being uh, uh, systematized in, in the way that we can take it. Also that as a culture, as, a, as an ethic, the, the company seems to be very data driven. So they want to use the data for, for, their, for their purposes. And then finally that they, they, are, uh, they have a focus on addressing uh, business problems. So they want to use the data to address the business problems. They may not necessarily know how yet, but they, they know that they want to get some business value out of it. Okay, so we come to the first use case. So what, what, what Bragg is trying to do is they are trying to implement dynamic pricing. Uh, so um, they have uh, all their transactions for however long, uh, and they have all the data points that might be useful, uh, and, they, and they want to see if, if, we, can, if we can get to this, uh, this scheme. So the question is, can machine learning be used to, uh, to address this business problem? Uh, and the answer is uh, yes. Uh, otherwise, probably I wouldn't be talking about it. Uh, the way that we can address this problem is by uh, using uh, what's called linear regression. And, and for many of the statisticians that are out there, this is very similar to multivariate uh, regression, okay? So um, let's, just, let's just think about the way that this is going to be done in a sequential way. 
uh, we know we have data sources and, and many data points are already given to us, okay? So we know the pickup location, we know the dropoff location, we know the distance, we know many things, okay? Now from this data, uh, that goes beyond, beyond this, uh, we have actually uh, the ability to create new data, okay? So we can look at, we can look at let's say, uh, uh, over the course of five minutes, how many requests did we receive? And this is a way that we can uh, understand demand. Uh, we can similarly determine how many drivers were made available uh, uh, during a certain five minute period of time and get, a, get the supply. So now we have two new variables, demand and supply, that we wouldn't have access to before. So these are things we had to engineer. And this is a very uh, prominent uh, um, uh, process in, in, uh, in data science or machine learning where we are creating new variables uh, for the machine learning model. Okay, and then we have this last variable, which is the variable that we want to predict. This is uh, sometimes what we call the, the label. Okay, so we have a variable that we want to predict, which is the fare. Now, what we want to do is we want to figure out the relationship between these data points and the fare. Now, let's go back to your secondary or whenever we learned these things and think about the, the equation for a, uh, uh, a line on a graph. Okay, so you may remember the equation y equals mx plus b, okay? Intuitively, what this is saying is that for every change in x, there's a corresponding change in y as modified by m, which is the slope, right? So now regression is basically taking this idea and is, and is trying to apply it to all the different uh, data points that we want to use to, pre to predict our y, to predict the fare. So now uh, every combination of mx that we have is let's say for every change in demand, we want to know uh, how much m modifies demand to come up with the fare. And sim similarly for supply and similarly for distance and so on, okay? So we have this pairing between mx uh, for each of these predictors. And uh, in, in machine learning, we have a, an elegant uh, way of portraying this, which the m is, uh, the Greek letter beta. So the same, the, you can rewrite this the same way, uh, mx plus mx plus mx and so on. We're just using beta here, okay? So then we have this, this, this equation which tries to determine uh, as demand changes, how is the fare changing? As supply is changing, how is the fare changing? And we do this for all the predictors. And the outcome of this is we have this nice line. And this line helps us to identify um, what would be the next fare given the, the current demand, given the current supply, given the, the distance of the request, things like that, right? Um, so, this, so this line now becomes the generalized uh, uh, mechanism that helps us to predict the fare. And through this, we give the, 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 the passenger information up front that given where you are, given uh, the current drivers available, you, we, the, your fare is going to be this, okay? Uh, I hope that is clear. Uh, uh, please uh, ask questions in the, in the chat if uh, I need to explain a bit more, um, uh, but, but this is the way that it looks and I hope the visualization uh, helps a bit. Okay, great. So now they have the, the dynamic pricing uh, integrated into their business model and now they have a new problem. This new problem is they want to uh, offer new services, okay? so. Um, they, they already went on a pilot uh, to uh, engage certain of their customers uh, to offer these new services. So now we have a sample uh, of data of who has liked the proposed service and who has not, okay? Um, they want to scale this. They want to scale from this sample to now the entire customer base. And they want, uh, they, they want to figure out a good way to, uh, 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 to, to reach out to those that uh, think uh, will be uh, interested and, and to ignore those that we think will not be used because we want to uh, re uh, allocate our resources uh, appropriately. So this problem, is this something that can be solved by machine learning? Again, the answer is yes. And, and what we would do in this case is we would use a technique called classification. Now, so what we're doing here is we are simply trying to uh, get an answer about uh, if, they, if we offer delivery services, will they like it or will they use it or will they not use it? It's just, it's just these two values, 
okay? Whereas fair was a whole range of values, right? It could be $20, it could be $19, it could be $18.51, and so on. But here we're just taking, we're just, we want two, uh, 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 we want two numbers, yes or no, or two, two outcomes, yes or no, okay? Okay, so the process is similar to regression where we have a set of data, uh, we have the, the variables that are already given, but then we can create new data. Okay, so based on, let's say, for example, the drop-off location or the pickup location, uh, we can determine uh, if it's a point of interest. Is that their place of work? Is it their place of residence? Is it a, a, a place that they uh, just somehow like to go uh, shopping around? Uh, whatever it is. Um, and, and similarly, uh, with uh, the, the number of uh, drivers that are avail available, maybe not all of them are taking requests. Maybe them are sitting idly. So then how many, uh, how many drivers do we have that are just sitting idly using our, our existing service, right? And now we're thinking about new services. So maybe the drivers can be used for these new services and they would be interested to provide delivery service as well. Okay, so now we come to the, the, the label, the, the target variable, which is uh, yes or no. Now we would do this for uh, each uh, uh, outcome that we're looking to achieve. The first outcome is do they want delivery services or not? The next outcome is do they want payment services or not? And so on and so on. For our purposes, we will just do one at a time uh, but in practice, you could do many or you can just do a few. Oftentimes, it's, it's one by one. Okay, so uh, there are a few ways of, of being able to make uh, these classes to determine whether someone belongs to the yes, I want delivery service or no, I don't want delivery service. One of them is by using uh, a similar uh, notion of that the regression uses, which is creating a line. And the purpose of this line is to best separate uh, the, the points. And so those that are above the point below belong to a certain class and those that are below the point belong to the other class, okay? So in this case, let's say that those that are above this line are those who want delivery services and those below the line are the ones that do not require delivery services or do not want delivery services, okay? So then the next data point that comes along uh, that we can just put uh, on this graph, if they are above or below, then we know how to, how to deal with it. Another way of going about classification is using uh, a decision tree. And uh, many of you are familiar with how decision trees work, and so the intuition is the same. You start at the top with a certain string of data, and you are asking questions about that data. Let's say we know the age of the person, and we ask the question, was, is, the, is this person above 35? Okay. If it's yes, then it goes to one decision node. If it's no, it goes to the next decision node. So the decision node is basically the, the junction where you would ask a question and then separate into different uh, two different outcomes. So it's just the node. So, so as you progress through these decision nodes, the, the, the model has greater and greater information about whether or not this person will want this service or not in, in our case, right? Um, so, this is, so this is another way of being able to tackle the, the same problem. So then at the end of the day, we have a whole set uh, of, of scaled uh, customers uh, who would like uh, potentially uh, the deli delivery service or would not like the delivery service. And then those that do want the delivery service, we can take them and we can offer, offer a customized approach uh, to engaging them on, on, uh, on offering that service. Um, it's, it's also useful to just go a, a briefly into um, other ways of performing the same type of idea of classification. The first one is recommendations. So in the previous example, we just had two outcomes. Do they want delivery services or do they want uh, payment services? But what if you have thousands or tens of thousands or millions of products or services that you can offer? Doing that for each one of them is going to be a disaster. Or maybe not a disaster, it's just going to be extremely lengthy. Um, so then uh, recommendation comes in uh, very usefully in this case where you, you, you go about this, the problem a bit differently by, by trying to compare yourself to another customer and their purchase history or their consumption history to be able to provide the next best offer, okay? Um, or to provide the service that they might like. Um, and uh, another uh, technique that is done is, is called clustering where we don't really know the answer. Um, we, we know that, in this case, we don't even necessarily know that we have services that we want to offer. Um, but, but we, we want to segregate uh, these data points in some way. We don't really know how, we don't know necessarily why, but we, we know we want to do it. So we can tell the model to, to put, uh, into, put, put the data into a certain amount of clusters. In, in the visualization, we're using three, but it could be five, it could be seven, it could be 10, whatever. And, and what, the, what the model will do is it will take all the data points, 
it will try to find the center of uh, a, a proposed cluster of data points, uh, and it will move the cluster so that it minimizes uh, the points in that cluster to the center. So then the result of that process is you have this visualization where you have the center in the middle of all these clusters um, uh, that constitute that, that cluster. So then this, it doesn't stop here. What then we have to do with this information is we have to think, okay, why is it that uh, these, these uh, customers were grouped together? What were, this, what were the similarities that they had? What were the attributes that they had? Um, so that then we can go back and say, um, okay, for, for these guys, uh, they had these attributes and therefore uh, we want to uh, consider them to be high net worth individuals. And this other segment, we call them uh, frequent users, or whatever it is, okay? But the, but the point is that we then need to add some human intuition a, uh, after the creation of these clusters to be able to proceed. And this is very useful for customer segmentation um, uh, in, in practice. Um, and, and or other cases where you don't necessarily know the answer, but you but you somehow want to do some grouping. Okay. Okay, that rounds out the discussion on um, the the under the hood portion, and and now it, it, we just want to kind of condense everything that we've talked about uh, in the in this session today. Um, the first is is just uh, when we think about uh, machine learning. Uh, in the way that it operates, it is similar to the way that human beings learn. The more experiences we have, the better our intuition becomes. And for a machine learning model, uh, the more data that we give to it, uh, the better it, it can perform. Right? So the, the, the greater amount of data, the higher quality data, the greater diversity of data will improve the performance of our machine learning models and its predictions. Um, that, that machine learning fits into the organizational context. Uh, both in terms of where it sits in, is it at a team level or is it across the organization, or in terms of a process, uh, it, can, it can be uh, followed by AI or other uh, types of decision making. Um, and then finally, that, um, that certain attitudes could, uh, and, uh, and postures and behaviors conduce well to machine learning implementations. And the, and the better conditions that we have uh, uh, created for machine learning, the, the better that the, the overall model would perform and the and overall the experience of implementing machine learning in our organizations becomes. Okay, uh, I think I'm out of time. Uh, I, I hope this uh, session has been has been useful. Of course, we can go quite deep into all of these uh, ideas and this is just the beginning, right? It's the, it's the, the starter kit. Um, but there's, there's much more that we could go into. Um, and so what I'd like to hear from you now is uh, the, the direction that we could potentially go in, what are the, 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 the concepts that we could go into or the things that we'd like to learn more about. If you want to learn about, um, about AI uh, or if you want to learn more about deep learning or you want to learn about uh, natural language processing, there could be many things that we could go into. And uh, if, you, if you'd like uh, to make your suggestions here, uh, it would be useful to, to know so we can provide a relevant and useful content. And then secondly, of course, I would also like to learn. I would like to learn from you the things I could have touched more on, that I could have uh, uh, done differently. If, if I was talking too fast, if, my, if I was yelling at you, I, whatever it is, I would like to receive your feedback as well. Um, so if you don't mind, just take a few uh, seconds just to uh, uh, create some feedback. Uh, that would be very useful and, and greatly appreciated. Um, that's, that's what I have. Uh, thank you very much. Um, feel free to reach out to me. I, I, I'd love to uh, talk more in depth about how machine learning can be applied in your organization or just conceptually how it works, whatever the conversation, the interest that you have, uh, I'd love to uh, continue that conversation. Uh, feel free to keep in touch with us. The QR code will link to our uh, LinkedIn uh, company page. Um, feel free to keep in touch with, with Palo IT and, and, and me specifically as you like. Uh, thanks a lot. Okay, uh, thank you, Ian, for sharing. Yep, uh, just to let you know, uh, let you guys know that we will be doing a recording for this session. So we will keep you guys updated with our recording as we will be sharing it on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. Yeah. So if, Thanks if you, a lot, Ian. Uh, yeah, of course. If, if, if anyone would like to stick around and ask some questions, I, I will stick around also. But feel free to take leave as I'm sure you uh, are all hungry and I'm the only one staying between you and lunch.